to everyone and thank you for the participation. I'm sorry for my English, I'm not an expert, <laughs> but I hope that you will understand me. So um, thank you, for, uh, Professor Hofsman, uh, that you participate in our uh, uh, webinar. And uh, we will st start with your presentation if you want. Okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, you can start. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to? I will say the title the importance of and the benefits of sharing and using, facilitating, and upscaling best practices in supporting children of parents with mental health problems. And uh, Professor uh, Hosman is a emeritus professor of mental health prevention and uh, in Maastricht University and uh, Rabut University in uh, Maastricht. <laughs> in the Netherlands. <laughs> yeah, the... thank you. Yeah, yeah? Yes, yes, you can. Okay, okay. Th thank you very much. And I uh, let me first say that I am very pleased to be invited to be part of this uh, uh, webinar. I think it's a very important uh, project and which I uh, very much like to support. It's uh, um, important that we are really moving forward in Europe. Okay, next slide. Um, yeah, the, I will talk, uh, um, well, only 10 minutes, so I, I need to do it quick. Uh, the first question is why do we need to invest in supporting this group of children and families? Um, secondly, there has been made a lot of progress over the last 30 years. I will give a very short summary, global. Um, I will stress the issue of sharing, uh, sharing what we have developed and um, uh, upscaling that in Europe. And the last part is about bottlenecks and successes, and but especially what are the issues for investment in the next agenda. Next uh, slide. Um, it, it's uh, probably for m uh, many of you already very well known that um, um, this group of, uh, of, of children that is growing up in families with a parents with a uh, me uh, serious mental problems. Um, it's a major risk factor. Um, it's, it's clear uh, if you, you, you look to a lot of research, then you see that the risk is three to even 13 times higher than for other uh, children. We see also that this is a problem that is uh, transmitted from generation to generation. And we just wait and see and afterwards we're trying to help with treatment. But now the question is, could we do something different? Could we do something in prevention? Um, it's, uh, uh, the, these are serious problems that they, the, the children have to face. Uh, it's not only just the parent who has mental illness, but mostly it's related to a, a wide range of other family problems. Um, and the problem, has gotten uh, a lack of recognition. Uh, we see that the, the impact is broad, long-term uh, impact to even old age, a, a wide range of adverse developments are possible in health, mental health, in, in, in social and financial impact. It's about a large group in society. We, we talk about four to, um, uh, uh, one in four to five children. So if you think about that in terms of Europe, we are talking about maybe 15 or 20 million children. That's a huge amount. Many uh, par uh, mental patients are themselves parents, around roughly 40 to 50%. Um, this group of children uh, show a high demand during their lives uh, for professional care. In my country at this moment, um, the demand for youth care is a huge problem. 
uh, just last week, there was in the paper a conclusion of a national committee that if we go on like this, the use care will not be payable anymore in 10 years from now on a country. So we need to do something in prevention. And uh, this is also a lot of problems that have an impact on our social life and uh, also on our economy. Next slide. Uh, we have worked now for, I, I, when I started, almost nothing was, was there in uh, the end of the 1980s. And, um, but over the years, 30 years, uh, worldwide, and we have a lot of collaboration, uh, a lot of uh, is uh, achieved. Uh, just a, a quick summary. Um, there is a huge amount of knowledge now available that we can use for making the situation and the, the lives of these children better. Um, we have a very wide range of evidence-based best practices, uh, effective practices um, that can be shared. We have a, a nowadays a worldwide coalition of advocates, of scientists, of uh, uh, people uh, with lived experience who share and collaborate uh, in research, but also in program development and in uh, um, sharing and disseminating what we have developed. Um, it's very clear that over the last 30 years, uh, the children themselves or the adolescents um, are um, speaking out and they are part of this whole enterprise. Um, and we are listening to them and that's very crucial. It's also showing that we, we, when we started, we started in the Netherlands uh, just with three people. Now we have a nationwide system for prevention and support for these children. Uh, and it, it's the same in Norway and many, on, and many other countries. Uh, I see it happening also in Italy now. Um, so going from small to big is possible. Uh, we see also in some countries, there is a legislation, supportive legislation, a national policy that is supporting, which is crucial. Next slide. Um, I, I could talk for two hours about all the interventions and, and support best practices, supported best practices that are uh, available now. In the appendix of my presentation, you find a list of them. I only want to stress now that we have a lot of interventions that are work, working, uh, are effective, specifically designed for these children, for these families, these adolescents. But in addition to that, uh, in our prevention fields, we have worldwide now also developed many, many other preventive interventions that are effective, proven effective, not developed for this group specifically, but are very much uh, helpful, also can be used for them to make their lives um, uh, better. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, uh, <laughs> and um, there, and, and, and in addition to that, we have we see now programs like Healthy Start of Life. It's our large programs where we could build in our own interventions or programs for uh, children of parents with a mental Ill illness. Um, so. We have a lot at this moment available. The big problem is that the use of it to make the lives of these children better is poor. Uh, so we have an implementation and a reach problem. Yes. Um, what are the current bottlenecks? Uh, there is still an insufficient <coughs> awareness um, in treatment. Um, psychiatry especially is mostly focused on parents as individual adults, not on the children, it's not, not frequently discussed. Uh, therapists have not the skills, the capacity, and the knowledge about uh, the copy problem, the, uh, problems. Um, in terms of prevention, uh, we have a lot, 
but it's limited use worldwide and also in Europe. Uh, it's, it's moving. Um, what is happening is fragmented still. Um, it's... Um, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, it has a small scale, a lot of pilots. It has a marginal reach. So if our efforts have a marginal reach in the population of children and families, um, then we have not a lot of social impact. And that's what we want to achieve in the end. Um, and we, in general, we lack also on a European level, national, local level, um, the support, the policy support and resources. We are working and you are working hard on that, but there's a, a lot to go. What are the main issues and challenges for our next agenda? Uh, this is my, uh, to my knowledge, the last slide. Um, we need to invest in large scale uh, psychoeducation, um, using social media, awareness programs, uh, reducing stigma. Uh, that's uh, uh, in itself a huge enterprise task. In healthcare, we need to make a big change in uh, mental health care, in primary health care, to get a family oriented approach and where uh, uh, doctors and uh, therapists and psychiatrists also talk and connect with the children and offer them support and offer them preventive support. That's a big change. Uh, that's not easy to get that done. In prevention, um, we have happily a strong role of the young carers themselves. And we need to invest in co-creation between professionals and young carers. Um, uh, we have a lot of knowledge and a lot of effective practices, so we need to invest in educating uh, professionals, organizations, policymakers about what we have and sharing that. Um, we need to overcome the, um, uh, uh, the, the scattered approach in making a strong approach combining different successful interventions in very important influential local community programs and integrate that with other youth programs um, to have really an impact and to reach um, our uh, uh, children population that we are uh, trying to support. Finally, um, we need to have a, a support of legislation, policies, resources, and professional standards. I've worked a lot on that issue in my country and, and helped some other countries with that. Um, it's possible. Uh, some countries show that it's really possible, but we need to learn from each other, but we need also to invest. If those legislation, policies, resources, and professional standards and uh, capacity building is not there, then we cannot make a big step forward. Uh, it means also that probably in this project, we need to develop a European Union database and training programs. And um, so my uh, plea is going from a clinical uh, focus to a more uh, a public health approach impact. And to summarize, uh, it takes a village to, to raise the child, it takes Europe to raise the child, it takes the country to raise the child. And the last one, if we work and do that together, we can make a difference for the future of many, many millions of children dealing with parents who suffer from mental illness or other hardships. It's a choice. It's your choice. It's our collective choice. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I believe that it was very constructive speech <laughs> and uh, presentation. Uh, yes, I totally agree with the, the role of society, of professionals, of the family, of everyone uh, that should uh, participate uh, in this uh, field. And I, I think that we, we will move on with the, the next presentation and then we have time to uh, make some questions and discuss about uh, the, the topic.
so uh, uh, Stefania, uh, you're next. Uh, Stefania Buoni is the president and CEO founder of Comi, and um, she will uh, present. Uh, 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 her presentation is uh, has the title "Breaking the Silence: Advocacy and Lived Experience Experts Inclusions as a Key to Improve Policies and Good Practices Across Europe." Uh, Stefania. Thank you, Eugenia, and thank you to Professor Hosman from the Netherlands. I'm uh, very emotional today because it's a big step. Uh, I've been in this field as an advocate since 10 years. And so the first question is, how do we break the silence? Uh, back in 2010, when uh, for the first time I was looking out on the internet uh, information in other languages to help my parents, uh, I bumped into forums in uh, Dutch language because my mom is Dutch, <laughs> uh, where I, for the first time, read stories by adult children survivors. And it was the first time they, I read the perspective of daughters and sons. And it was an eye opening moment for me. The center was not the illness of the parents for one time, but it was uh, the reflection and consequences on, on us as daughters and sons. Um, all of my life, I had been concentrated on the emergency of uh, my parents' suffering and their moment of severe crisis and on surviving between one relapse and the other. And I knew I had suffered too, and uh, I was still suffering, but my parents were officially unwell, not me. Therefore, uh, unconsciously, my own needs stepped aside, hiding tremendously well until the pain grew so big and overflew, and that was the crack where the light started to crawl in. And the start of the change that led me here today to break the silence for me and for many others like me in the world. Why is there so much silence on forgotten children? Uh, Professor Clemens Hosman said it well, the stigma. Mental health is still very stigmatized all over the world. It still doesn't have the same dignity and respect as physical health. But the truth is, is that they are actually intertwined. We as individuals are all intertwined to one another. And all aspects of our lives are involved in and by our mental health. Friends, family, studies, work, our passions, our identity, money, love, relationship, and social status. So responses to mental health problems can't just be individual. They must be systemic, political, I have to say. Education about how to protect our mental wellness should be part of our bringing, part of our society. Forgotten children are just one of the many symptoms telling us how stigma is still huge. Since we as a society don't like to face the painful reality that parents might unwillingly cause pain to their children due to their own suffering. We often fail to acknowledge them and support them both. So no guilt, but support. What, what is very important to me is that not all parents with mental ill health are aware of their condition and are in treatment. And so in, in this case, the price uh, daughters and sons pay for their invisibility is higher. I know what this means because that happened to me for a long period. So normalizing the conversation around mental health is the first step to make prevention a reality for everyone. But this requires a cultural revolution in which each, in which each one of us is involved. Removing stigma from mental health is the key to make knowledge, support and inclusion real and accessible to anyone regardless of their age and their economical status. So schools, workplaces, the media, GPs, we all need to do more to protect our mental health and make it a priority in all of our lives. Which challenges could a child or adolescent face when having one or both parents with mental ill health? These are just some examples, there's a lot more. They might be doing household tasks, they might be between parental conflicts, uh, maybe they have to provide emotional support for the parent or dealing with doctors uh, and emergencies, um, figure out what happens when a parent has a suicidal attempt 
or uh, an amenic episode with psychosis and you are the only one there. And you might have... Uh, yes. Sorry, sorry for the interruption, but uh, we can't see uh, your presentation. We see the f only the first, uh, the cover page the, in our screen. How do you uh, well, I tried to stop them and re-upload them because uh, I don't know oh, what's happening, but I can try to share them again. Let's see if this works. Let me know, do you see it moving? No. No. It's, it's a very stable message. Let me see if I do this way. Other way, so yeah. this works. Yeah. This yeah. works, okay. yes. yes. Yes, it works. <laughs> Resilience, you see. <laughs> It happens. <laughs> it's useful in life. <laughs> so you might risk to have um, to be a subject of bullying in school. Um, and also, uh, what is important is that when uh, uh, you are unaware of being a young carer, um, you become, in fact, one of the millions of young carers in the world. Uh, the terminology young carers is the UK one that we use, uh, uh, but uh, actually children and adolescents uh, don't identify with this terminology. They don't even know this terminology. And also um, it's a huge, a broad term that refers to um, children and adolescents living with one or more family members who suffer from an illness or from an alcohol or substance abuse. So there are different levels of caregiving in this terminology not only practical aspects of care, but also emotional caregiving to the mentally ill parent or dealing with younger siblings. Uh, uh, but you as a, as a child or adolescent no, are not aware of what you do and that you often did not choose to do. For many, these are only survival mechanisms because there is no one else to help you out. And all of your efforts in daily life often go totally unseen. And no one, no one ever said thank you for what you're doing. And also if the parent's illness is severe and untreated, you might also be neglected and or verbally and physically abused. So prevention in mental well-being is key to let children just be children and not having to carry the suffering alone on their shoulders. That is why <laughs> stigma is so important on a general level, because this is what actually happens when we don't invest on eradicating stigma and in mental health education. Uh, why parents and children's voices need to be heard and included? Uh, because young carers uh, sometimes, uh, very often I must say, uh, often do not have energy and time to advocate for the rights. And not only this, but also the stigma surrounding mental health often requires to keep the family secrets. <laughs> so this makes make you fall completely behind the agenda of the institutions. And media often only portray uh, stereotypes uh, and you know, reinforcing stigma. So when you, do you read the news or you see the TV news? Sometimes you only hear bad news about this and uh, this reinforces the problem. So we as daughters and sons and our parents and families need to contribute to change the way our stories are told. Uh, resilience and hope, as I see in my own experience and in my advocacy and peer support experience are powerful means to encourage those who are still finding their way out of suffering. This has to be in the stories, not only the risks, but also what happens when we tackle these risks. And connecting and making a difference out of our pain makes uh, us break the loneliness and the isolation. So inclusion is really a part of the solution. Uh, this is, I'm very happy that Ninka is here today because she is one of the co-founders and inspirators with me and Elsa Tweedy from Scotland of the Eurocares Young Cares Working Group. Uh, I thank Eurocares, the European Federation of uh, Caregiver, Family Caregivers, 
uh, of this opportunity because in October 2017, building from the energies that we shared during the Malmo International Young Carers Conference, we built uh, a Young Carers Working Group where uh, um, mainly all people with lived experience as young carers and former young carers from uh, 10 European states and from Australia are together working to change the world. So I will show you uh, what we are up to. Uh, we are working together on a campaign addressed to policymakers. Uh, we started from the European pillar of social rights and we chose four out of the 20 principles which are inclusive education, active support to employment, child care and support to children, and long-term care. And then we then indicated some measures to achieve the, the solution that we want to see. Uh, the other uh, work we are doing is on an awareness campaign uh, targeted to a broader public. Um, first of all, the young carers who are not aware of being young carers or who are reluctant to say they are but also the stakeholders, service providers uh, from educational field, from the health field, social care, non-governmental organizations and general public. Because the problem is that policymakers only act if we have a critical mass. So many people need to, to feel how important mental well-being is for everyone. And so also to protect children and adolescents who often have to, to, to carry on the shoulders the difficulty the families are facing. So this is really, really important. If you want to know more, you can go to uh, this, the website of MeWe Project and you can download a lot of material that you can share with your colleagues and, um, and also to journalists. And uh, there is no time to lose because we really need to, to help the life chances of thousands of children across Europe. Uh, if you want to know more about the COMIP, uh, it's the first uh, GO in Italy created by and for adult children and children of parents with mental ill health. Uh, and it was established on the World Children's Day. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders, and this is our first European project as partners. So uh, I want to thank you for listening, and please don't stop here. We can uh, continue to collaborate and to make many millions of lives of children and adolescents and parents better across the world. Thank you. Yes, congratulations. Thank you for the presentation and your campaigns. Uh, I believe that can make the difference uh, in this uh, effort. Uh, so, uh, Stefania, can you help me? Uh, we are continuing with the video of uh, the, the um, sorry, I'm lost. Ah, of uh, Miss Matias Marisa. Uh, we have the video of uh, her uh, presentation because she couldn't manage to uh, attend the webinar. Uh, the title of the video is We Work for, for the Rights of Informal Carriers Count on Us. Uh, Mattia, uh, Ma can you tell us, uh, Stefania, a few words about uh, Ms. Matthias Marisa? Yes, Marisa Matthias is a member of the European Parliament from Portugal. And also uh, she's candidated for presidential election in her own country, but she's also very passionate and working uh, within the interest group of informal cares at the European Parliament. So she's very sensitive. And so I'm uh, delighted that she has accepted to send her uh, her video message for us. Hi, everybody. I'm Marisa Matias. I'm a member of the European Parliament from Portugal. And I wish I could be with you today, but unfortunately I have a conference at the same time and you know that it's very difficult. In any case, I want to just say some words on this issue because it's very important. I'm part of the interest group for uh, carers across Europe and uh, I do recognize the work that you are doing, the different projects and also the Euro carers, the way is. Uh, paying attention to such an important issue in order that to provide justice to everyone in Europe. I've been working on these uh, problems for, I don't know, more than 10 years, 
and uh, unfortunately we still don't have an answer to all carers across Europe. We know that the majority of the care is provided by carers and formal carers in the majority of the cases and uh, we still need to have uh, measures across Europe to provide the rights, the support, uh, not only financial support but also financial support. Normally, when we talk about carers, uh, we talk mainly uh, about uh, adults taking care of their parents or we talk about parents taking care of their children for some reason. And normally, we don't talk much about the subject of this conference, which is children taking care of their parents. And uh, it happens and it happens a lot across Europe. Uh, it's not uh, um, uh, a very simple issue to deal with because when we talk about children who take care of their parents is normally, as you are discussing, the issue of uh, parents with mental health problems. And so we have to try to, to, de to devote our time in order to find solutions for all the dimensions of this problem. First of all, children shouldn't be taking care in that sense. They should be also subject of care. And so it's very difficult, not only because they don't have the means, as they don't have the psychological support in the majority of the situations. Also because we still need to fight the discrimination of people suffering from mental health uh, problems, as we still don't have the same answer, the same capacity, uh, and the same resources to deal with uh, the mental health problems. Also, the visibility of these problems is not, I would say, at the same level as other types of disease. I don't know, other types of chronic diseases or physical diseases, in the sense that you have something to show. And that's um, a huge problem. For the children, they need to be protected. They need to have psychological support, but for the parents who suffer uh, mental health problems, they also need to be protected and they also need to have support. So we are trying to find all the dimensions of the caregiving and try to find solutions, political solutions, in order to provide the support. I will not speak as an expert on this because I'm not and I know that experts have been talking in, the, in this conference. So I will look after uh, and see what are these expert contributions because as police, policy decision makers we have the obligation also to listen to experts. We have the obligation also to listen to the, caregive, the carers because the way uh, society is organized we need to listen to these people in order to avoid silence them and forget them and not provide the proper answers. Uh, in Portugal, we were able to, to create um, a, a, a kind of legal provision to support and to recognize the work of the informal carers. But I have to say that one part which is not covered is when we have children as carers. And so that's something that we still need to work as well at the national level. Uh, I thank you very much for, for giving visibility to this problem. And I really am willing to work together with you and to have all the feedback concerning the expertise in the field in order that we can advance as a group of the European Parliament composed of several members from different political groups uh, that we want to help you. We want to provide political solutions for this and especially to have uh, an answer, a social answer, some justice, some care and fully rights, human rights and dignity uh, to those who devote their lives taking care of their wounds. Of course, with the children, as I said, there are different levels that we need to take into account. So I'm looking forward to work with you and um, just say that we, we were organized as a group in the parliament specifically to deal with these issues and to try to give answers to problems like the one you are raising in this conference. Thank you so much and please count on us. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
I believe that we really need the help and the support of uh, European members of the parliament. Uh, so we will continue now with the, um, the presentation of uh, Ms. Vero uh, Krasborn. Uh, I'm here. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Thank hello. you for joining. <laughs> hello, Jam. Hello, so, uh, Netherlands and Greece, Italia. I, I, I met Stefania already, uh, Turkey. So I'm here in France, but I'm from Belgium. I'm happy to be with you and to share your time with you. Thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you for joining our webinar. <laughs> thank you very much. You can show the, the trailer now and then after I will shortly introduce and maybe talk about my point of view, which is very, uh, uh, I need to, to, to spread out the words. It's very important to listen to us because nothing about us without us. And this is my point of view. And I met already with Stefania, with Frédéric and with uh, Stephanie also and uh, in other countries. And I'm very happy to share this with you. So let's show the trade-off uh, into that with. Tu vois la forêt, c'est comme la mer. Exactement. Oui, oui, doucement, doucement, doucement. Attention. Voilà. Non, 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 donne pas de coups. Laissez les enfants, j'arrive pas à me concentrer. C'est moi. Prenez tout ce que vous voulez. On n'a qu'à tout laisser ici. Ils verront pas. Attendez-moi dehors, les enfants. On va rentrer par la forêt. Lâchez-le c'est un début d'épisode psychotique. Il a besoin de soins. Vous devez penser à vous, à vos enfants. C'est juste pour quelques jours. Tu l'as fait enfermer, c'est ça la vérité. Mais qu'est-ce que tu crois Tu crois que c'est facile pour moi Gina Vous êtes tous tarés ou... C'est juste votre père. Tu crois que je serais comme papa Fait Jimmy le fou. Il est pas fou, mon père. Oh, Vous touchez pas à mes filles. Ta gueule, le vieux, t'es sérieux It's a little bit uh, complicated to, uh, to watch this online, but I invite you to go on Facebook. Uh, we have a special, special page or on our website, uh, La Forêt de Mon Père, uh, and maybe I will share this in the um, conversation part. But uh, this movie, so it, in the title, you have already what is a mental illness of my father. So it's not a copy and paste of my own story. This is fiction. And for me, it's very it, it, um, uh, important to have fiction because we have, uh, in my life, as I was a teenager and a child, I received a lot of cameras on me just to tell me, you have to say, you have to say, you have to tell the story, you have to spread out your world and we will get this. And this is uh, like, it, this is very important to spread out the world. But what is important is also to exist as a child, as a teenager, and this is very important, and this protects us. And that's why I'm fighting, and Stefania knows, because I'm fighting, because I'm a survivor of uh, all the system, of uh, the protection, of the kids' protection system. So my family, my brothers, I'm uh, the oldest daughter, uh, daughter of my parents, and so my four brothers, we have been kept out of the family. So if there is a child of mentally ill parents, you have the families of the, the kids and you have the parents. And with this movie, because it's a fiction, it's not my own personal story, but it's true. 
when I screen uh, the film abroad, so in Belgium, in France, uh, in Ireland, in Berlin yesterday, uh, and in Edinburgh, um, this allows the other people to tell about their own stories and then to share. And my concern, and I'm very happy to talk to you, is that um, I have made a, a screening with teenagers in schools, and my, uh, my film goes to uh, uh, normal cinemas, which is very important. Every day I receive letters, and not to preach the convinced. Do you understand what I mean? If, if, you, if you preach the convinced, the, the people are very aware. And what um, is touching me a lot is when I meet a people, and this movie allows them to say, to say, okay, I'm not a monster. It's my story also. I'm not a monster. I'm a human. I'm a survivor, but I'm not only a survivor. I'm a human people. And this is very important to, to know that we are not only the story of this mental illness of our parents, because we are people. And we are not only uh, always strong people, we are also fragile and we, uh, we need to have support, but not over protection. We need to, be, to, to have uh, um, uh, friends, boyfriends, girlfriends, uh, schoolmates. We need this. And we don't need to be on, only the problem of our parents because our parents sometimes they have a lot of problem. It's very difficult and a heavy life to take care of them, but there are also resources, resources for us. Like my father, my father, he has a forest in his head. He hears voices and maybe I'm a film director because he has shared with me something. The problem is now that I'm, I grown up and the, the, the society with people getting older and older. So I'm still a, a caregiver because our parents, we have to deal with them when we are young and it's a long life. You know, you understand what I mean? A lifetime. And now the society is such so that they put everything out in the families to the carers. So we have, uh, we, I have kids. My father, my, my uh, brothers have kids also. How can we deal with this life? Because nobody helped us. It's just uh, this story. So my movie is um, going uh, with a teaching file and I'm fighting and I exist on the stigma, Stefania, because, because when you are at school, so you see in my trailer, it's, uh, it's also the teacher. So I'm very happy in Belgium. My film for the moment is in a school for teachers, future teachers, to help them to understand, to understand our point of view. Uh, and it's very important for me, and it's a success for me to have this. So I will be in seven schools, high schools in France also. So beginning of this, this year with a movie to share with a, a young, uh, people to be normal cinema is very very important because uh, people uh, who have a living in so playing with actors so they go to the cinema to watch a movie with actors and they write me yesterday uh, a german girl write me on instagram to tell the same like me can can we talk so uh, i um it's finished but i i want to say thank you to frederick because she's the first who gave me the right to I'm very touched to, to talk about this because Frederick, thank you. The right to talk by, from my point of view and not to have only written stories about old people who are very, uh, they have good intentions, but sometimes they, they talk instead of us. And it's very important, Frederick and Hélène Daftian to give us the right to spread the world by our own light. So I thank you. I thank you so much. So we are building a platform which is built from this movie with Frédéric. So in Belgium, in France with Hélène Daftian, 
in uh, Luxembourg with Canel, and also in Switzerland with Sylvia Paraga. And please, let's listen to the children, not too much overprotection. Please let's, let's listen to us and let's build a better society with us. So let's, uh, if you want to contact me to screen the movie, I'm fighting be because there are a lot of movies, cinema is a lot of psychiatry, so madness and everything. And so they don't want to listen to this story. So maybe you, in your own country, you can invite this movie into high school and fight to spread the word. So thank you so much. Thank you, Vero. Thank you very much. And let's keep fighting. Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you very, very much uh, for your uh, presentation and being here with us. And I hope that uh, when you can, <laughs> uh, I would like to invite you in Greece to talk about your film, your work uh, uh, to, to everyone, to specialists, to children. Uh, this is great, great work. Thank you, thank you. Maybe you can also do like uh, Stefania do to write to the festivals, to the cinema festivals to say, okay, we want this movie in cinema, not only I already did. Unfortunately, Italy is not an easy country, I must say. I already written to everyone, <laughs> but I keep fighting. <laughs> we have screened the movie. Stefania does a great job because we have screened my movie in a forest. For example, it's good to have the forest. And I just want to tell that uh, thanks to, I was with Frédéric and the ombuds um, person from Belgium, so, so the rights for the kids. Yes, in, uh, I have uh, invited uh, the the parliament, like uh, the miss uh, from Portugal, to watch the movie, and this is very important also. But uh, we need to have uh, testimonies yeah. with the movie from other people, because this is very important. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, uh, I was here for a short time, but thank you. Uh, if you have time, uh, we will continue with another round presentation, then we will have a discussion. So if you have time to stay until the end, it will be our pleasure. <laughs> Maybe I will come uh, after because I'm, I'm now uh, I'm uh, at school, so I'm uh, in a training. Thank you so much. If you want, uh, you can send the, the teaching file in English. So we have it in German, in English, and in French. Maybe Frédéric, uh, you can, uh, send it. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Merci, Vero. Merci. <laughs> Evgenia, you are muted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was thinking alone. <laughs> so we will continue with uh, the book presentation. And uh, thank you uh, for being uh, here, Dr. Frederick van uh, Leuven. <laughs> uh, so uh, the title of your book is Taking Care of Parents and Family During Psychiatric Hospitalization. Hello. Hello, Eugenia. Hello, everybody. Is the sound OK? Yes, yes. You're OK. okay. Um, so uh, thank you very much to, for giving us the floor um, to me and uh, to Stephanie Tange, who worked with me at the hospital. Um, we are very happy to participate today and we are very happy to feel part of a community. The first time it happened, maybe it was with Vero, when I met Vero a few years ago. And I'm really feeling that all this work is, is going from by proxy, meeting people and meeting people. And uh, little by little, we are constructing some kind of community about this question. So um, I will first take uh, five minutes uh, to present myself and how uh, I got involved in, in this question, in this today question. Then I will take some time to present the book. Uh, the book is called uh, Grandir avec des parents en souffrance psychique, Growing up with parents with psychic suffering, uh, which was published, published in um, 2017 with Cathy Collier, who's, um, yes, there it is, with Cathy Collier, who's clinical psychologist and uh, fa family therapist. 
And then I will give the floor to Stephanie uh, so that she can describe the device we have implemented in our hospital. Um, so first, no, let's go back to the beginning. We, we don't need, uh, we don't need uh, the slides now. You can close them. I will tell you, Jocelyn, I will tell you when we need them. You can close them, yes. So first, in five minutes, um, I'm a psychiatrist, actually. I work in a um, very big hospital with about 300 patients. And I'm responsible for the mo mobile crisis team. So we go to family homes in crisis situations. I'm responsible for the daycare hospital. And I'm responsible for the family projects in the hospital where I arrived um, 11 years ago. It's a hospital located in Wallonia, in Belgium. We are French speaking. Um, but uh, how, how do I come, came to be involved in the question? Um, I was in my first professional life, I was child psychiatrist. Um, and uh, about 20 years ago, I was working in a psychiatric unit for adolescents. And um, I was struck by the fact that um, many of the adolescents who were hospitalized in psychiatry had um, parents with uh, psychiatric problems. And um, some of them were really worried to be hospitalized because they were worried about having the same pathology as their parents. And in life, it's, all, it's always like that. Sometimes you meet people who really guide uh, your professional career. And for me, it has often been patients. And so the first patient I met who really struck me is uh, his pseudo is Amaro. He was 16 when I met him. Now he must, he's over 40 and he's fine. But at the time he was 16 and um, he didn't want to come into psychiatry because he was so afraid to be bi bipolar as his mother. And uh, his story is that um, Amaro had been living uh, alone with his mother in a house that was totally isolated until six years old. So he didn't go to school. He was only with his mother and watching television. And finally, when he was six, um, the neighbors uh, reported the situation to the child welfare services. And what happened is that Amaro was placed in an institution and his mother disappeared. And she disappeared forever. He never got news anymore. She left for another country and um, he had no father. And so he started his um, career as a placed child. And so uh, he went from center to center. Uh, when he arrived at 16, um, he was coming from a center for delinquents and we were the 49th place of living for him. He was 16. And so um, Amaro was really worried, am I, bipolar, like my mother, but in fact, he was not suffering from bipolarity. He was suffering from a severe attachment disorder. And that's what was happening to many of the young people. They were not suffering psychiatric problems like their parents. They were suffering from something, something else that were the consequences of the psychiatric problems on the life of their parents and then on their own lives of the consequences here and now in every day. And so that's really important to know that. And so if we wanted to work uh, with these children, with these adolescents, first we had to take care of their attachment disorder. And he told me a lot about that, but maybe the most important is at one moment that Amaro was asking, how come I'm here in psychiatry? What am I doing here? Where do I come from? What was my mother's problem? And it is so difficult uh, when you have children uh, and parents who have disappeared for so long, it's so difficult to get information about them. You just have a diagnosis. You don't know who's the parent. And for Amaro's parent, we could never find his mother. Um, and so he has to construct himself with such, such small things, um, such small souvenirs before six years old. And so I was also working at the moment um, in a service for foster families a lot of uh, place, uh, place children in foster families have also parents with these type of problems. And the configuration was the same. At one moment, the children were asking, why am I placed here? Why am I in a foster family? And um, sometimes even the parents didn't know why their children were placed. Uh, and it was also so difficult to organize encounters between the biological parents and the, and the kids. Sometimes you had a psychotic mother, she would come from another place of Belgium, she had to take the train and the bus 
it was so complicated and she could see her child one hour um, just with a video or talking about some, some, some small things. And it was so disappointing for the kids and so disappointing for the parents. So we had to imagine devices. That was the first moment we started to imagine that um, so that the encounter could be different and could be constructing and could be nice for both of them. And uh, the, the story really started when I was working in a mental health center and we had a lot of kids who were living in that place but living with their parents. And that's why when 19 years ago, we, uh, we, we constructed the, the first group with children and adolescents who had in common point who have a parent with uh, mental health problems. Um, and they, I cannot tell all the story now, but they told me a lot. And what happened is that they really convinced me that um, it was important to implement devices in the places where the parents are taken care of. And I didn't know the works of uh, Titi Solantos in Finland, Finland at that moment, but we really go in the same sense, in the same direction. It's that it's important to work upstream, not downstream, to work in prevention to work with people who are taking care of the parents. And that's how I, I arrived finally in Manage um, 11 years ago. In between, I had met Cathy Collier, uh, who was working uh, in Brussels and Louvain-la-Neuve. And um, we animated seminars uh, seven years at the Man Brussels Mental um, League for Mental Health. And finally, we ended by writing a book. So, Jocelyn, tu peux montrer la première dia. Jocelyn, maybe you can show us, yes. So this is the book that was published in uh, 2017. And it's, um, so the title is Grandir, that means grow up. And it's in two senses because um, the children, it's the reality, children grow up with parents, even if they are placed. Uh, but growing up also means getting, uh, learning things, getting mature. And uh, so the title is also a reference to how um, children have resources and also how there are resources for us um, um, carers uh, when we really listen to them. And so the, birth, the book is divided in uh, three parts. Uh, the first one, uh, on peut mettre la diapositive suivante. The first one, which is um, the cover of the book is a college. And so the first part is about emotion, uh, emotions and experiences that we commonly meet um, uh, among children who have this experience as Stefania. Stefania transmitted a lot of emotions of this kind. And so it's about uh, loneliness uh, and isolation, about the sense of shame and guilt about emotions like fear, anger, but also um, fascination and love sometimes. And it's a lot about doubts and confu confusions. So really, we really um, start from testimonies of uh, children and young adults about that. We'll just give this one example, uh, the, the precedent one, the precedent, yes. This first example, it's uh, Martin, he's uh, 11 years old. And uh, he's a patient of Cathy. And what he says is, up there, alone in my tree, I often cried and I was dreaming about the leaves that seemed to be singing in the wind. And so Martin, you see, there is this little nest in the middle of the tree. And so he's lonely, but he dreams. And so he's telling us that um, um, there is loneliness, there is sadness, but there is also dream and uh, singing and poetry. And um, in all these emotions, we also take testimonies of parents who share a lot of emotions uh, with their children. Um, really, the, the book is written on a very thin thread between dramatization, not dramatization, and no, no banalization. And it's sometimes difficult to really find the right line um, to avoid dramatization, but to avoid banalization. So the second part of the book is about complex family relationships. So here we have a second drawing. Um, so it's about uh, relationships like uh, empathy, parentification, um, the difficulty to go away from the family, to leave the family when you grow up. It's about the relationships between brothers and sisters. 
Um, and sometimes you think that the relationships uh, that it's good to have brothers and sisters in that kind of situation, but the children say that it's not so easy. And so that's this drawing is about that. It's about silence, taboo, the things that are not said, uh, not known because not looked for, like the poet T.S. Eliot says. And so this is Tom, nine years old, and that's what he says about his drawing. The parent is lying in bed. One child is sitting next to him on the terrace railing, looking outside, but he's next to his parent. The other child is sitting in the living room. They do nothing together. They would like to go outside and play with the neighbors, but the mother doesn't like that. They have to stay at home. She's afraid for them, and we have to, say, to stay silent. So uh, this story is also, uh, the second part is also about the importance to work with uh, siblings. And the third part uh, is about how to deal and transform psychic suffering. And so um, it's, um, it has also a lot of testimonies of professionals. So how can we explain mental health problems to the children? Um, how can we deal with the professional secret? Um, you, you see often um, when um, a parent has like a delusion, for instance, the first reaction is to separate the child from the parent, like the story of Amaro I was telling you, uh, his mother had delusion, um, they placed him and that was the end. Um, so the first reaction is to separate, but then after that it's the silence. And we think that uh, silence is worse uh, than living with delusion because it leaves the child really in uh, confusion and doubts and that's really destructive. Uh, so how can we deal with that in our different systems? Uh, how can we enhance uh, family resources and be creative with that? And how can we work with siblings? And also what type of devices can we imagine? And here we have uh, the, this drawing of Sarah who's 10 years old. And what she says is, the hospital is far away from everything in a gray land. There were no colors on the walls. There was very few decoration, no space for children, except a garden with very high walls. And so this leads us, merci Jocelyn. Um, this leads us to our, our present to Stephanie presentation. Uh, in our hospital, about 70% of the parents uh, of the patients are parents, not always of uh, minor children, of course. Um, I think we have, um, like Clement said, about 45% of them who are parents of minor children. Um, and um, so we developed a device that's um, in three stages, or we could say three different steps. The first stage, and really the basic step, is to provide what we, do, we would call uh, the welcome dimension. So we want that all the children, that every child who comes to the hospital to visit his father, his mother, his stepfather or mother, his grandparents, his aunt or uncle, that every child is welcomed as a child. Not because he's in a target group at, at risk, not because he's supposed to be suffering, not because he's uh, eventually a carer, um, just because he's a person, he's a close relative, he's implied, and he has to be recognized as a person. And so we really think that this welcome uh, dimension is, is, the basis, is the basis. It's also often the first contact that a child will have with, with psychiatry. And we know how these uh, first contact, contact can be destructive for some children. They can be really afraid by the hospital and by the contact with professionals. So it's really important that the first impression is positive and that they feel really welcomed. And it is also important that the patients who are hospitalized feel welcome as parents. And so this is how we opened the, what we call the Espace Enfant, family, space for children and families that Stephanie will talk to you about. The second stage, and it's really relying on the first one, is how we, we call the parents and developed um, also multi-family groups. And the, first, the third stage is the care. It really comes after the two first ones. 
and that's the family consultations. It can be a debriefing about traumatic events because sometimes when you have uh, parents who are hospitalized uh, by force, huh, forced hospitalization, often kids have lived really um, frightening things. And so it's important to make a debriefing, but it's also about explaining a uh, mental health problem and listening to the children. What have they seen? What do they think? They have their own theories also about um, mental health problems and um, Stephanie will say you more about that. Um, so that's the place where we discuss how everyone in the family lives with these kind of problems. So now I will give um, the floor to Stephanie, who's the, I could say the kingpin, uh, maybe the queen pin, <laughs> uh, the backbone of uh, all our device. Voilà Stephanie, je te laisse la parole. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um... Okay, uh, first, uh, I told you to welcome. We welcome children who visit their hospitalized parents in a place that's specially designed and furnished for families separate from the hospitalization units. We offer a benevolent cocoon setting as natural as possible. The place is open twice a week on Wednesday and Saturday. We are a small team of welcoming carriers who are present at each permanence. No registry is necessary, except now because of the COVID. We're there to make family feel as comfortable as possible. We don't take notes, we don't make reports. Our only objective is to make families feel at home. Stefania said, let children be children. Just be children. The children's library open in its door on October 2010. We have welcomed nearly 3,500 children and as many special story of dad, mom, grandparents, uncles, and aunts. We celebrate Christmas, birthday, uh, Easter. Uh, authenticity is the key, the most important for a real encounter. Um, euh, on peut peut-être montrer les images, comme ça on voit de quoi on parle. Monsieur Jocelyn. <laughs> Merci. Thank you. Uh, for example, one day the first hospitalization service brought us a mother to visit the space before our doctor arrived. The mother was so overwhelmed that she could not stay which made us wonder about the possibility of bringing our doctor, but we say, we try it. And we found a perfectly adequate mother when our doctor arrived. So much that we decided to open a little longer to let them enjoy this moment. Um, we organized groups. Uh, first, the parenting groups. Parenting groups uh, at the Children's Space start five years ago now. The principle being to bring together um, parents, grandparents around the topic that is important for them. But also the expectant parents who ask a lot of questions. Uh, some even wonder if they have the right to have children. Alors, they discuss their difficulties, how to talk to children about the disease, how to manage the guilt of being less present with children, lack of patience, fatigue. Uh, how to accept hospitalization when we know it will affect your children. Um, how to explain a disease you don't under understand yourself. Uh, how to take care of yourself when everything falls apart around us. How to deal with shame, prejudice. What is the role of the parents answering security rather than the time spent together? It's different if you are a parent the transmission, Irene's life. How to explain that love is not enough to heal. But also they were source. They advise themselves how to approach the disease with children and the fact that often the children are not formed. The importance of asking what they understood about the situation. Discuss, relapse and promises that cannot be kept. We provide information about children's services. Furthermore, we would like uh, to develop other devices. Set up a group of children who would exchange with each other. 
uh, information session in, on the different DCs should be organized and this group should be open to spouse, spouses, families. The importance of knowing your own illness well in order to communicate better with our children. Uh, we organize parents notebook group. It's a group that addresses parenthood to the medium of creative college. The parent receives a small notebook that he can evolve during the group with the instruction given, but also alone if he wants. The multifamily group, once a month, this group is a place of discussion and exchanges around the different experiences and experiences that psychic disorder lead to pass through. It brings together users, family, and professional. We welcome children from the age of 14, and this creates a particular dynamic between them. Uh, topic cover, diagnosis, medication, how to live with a person who is no longer the one who was married as a result of the illness, how to make loved ones understand that one is doing his best. Alors, we also offer family consultation. When children are asked the question, what they are experiencing most badly is not being taken into account by the professional who care for their parents. Why they are in the front row since they live with them every day. Secret is not opposite to truth, but to communication, said Serge Tisseron. Clarify where we are and what we do there. Debrief is, if necessary, crisis situation. What the child did and who advoked the drama. Family were, oh, sorry. <laughs> there is no point in talking children of the hell if it's to put them in the desert, said Jasper Jules. Um, it reminds me a situation of a psychotic mom and six years old girl who took care of everything, support both the little girl who had things to say and the mother who did not understand all the steps in progress. It's important to recognize what the chief is giving, to thank him. Uh, we want to be a place where you're not afraid of the truth, uh, creating the, condi the condition for sharing, to be able to apologize, the question being what the child understood about the situation, if he, was, if he feels worried, if he asks questions, his day-to-day -day life, uh, does the parent trust the person who cares for his child, um, being able to discuss violence in school, uh, how do you deal with your daddy is crazy? In conclusion, uh, take care of parenting helps contribute to a faster recovery. On the first COVID wave, our space had to close uh, for three months. The visits were allowed only for one family member and we could notice the impact on mental suffering in families. It may be one of the causes in the slower recovery we could observe at that time. It's so important to say that in Belgium we have absolute absolutely no kind of structural funding for this kind of project. It all holds on the willingness of the institution that use its own funds. We believe that it should be a part of mental health policy that should encourage institutions to be family friendly. Thank you and sorry for my English. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> Thank you very much, both of you, for the, the presentation. As you were speaking, I was thinking that uh, in my point of view, uh, I am a social worker, clinical social worker in a mental health uh, hospital. Uh, and uh, I was thinking uh, that we don't have a space for the children. We They can't come to see their parents, the younger and the... Uh, if they are not adults. And this is a great problem because I remember um, a mother, she was really young, she was with the first psychotic episode, uh, she, had, she had four children. And I remember the two was waiting in the door of the hospital 
until they can see their mom. And uh, I was talking to them, explain why they cannot join in the hospital. They, there wasn't a space to, to meet their mother. And uh, that was pretty much, uh, <laughs> but uh, so I admire you for your work and, uh, and uh, all these things that we are working uh, about the children with uh, the parent, with, who has parents with mental uh, health problems. Thank you, thank you very much. You're a great example for us. <laughs> mm -hmm.